Every leader faces the tug of war between competing demands. We must deliver results today and innovate, invest and remain profitable for the future. We've got to focus on the parts and the whole and also the needs of customers and the needs of the organization. These challenges share a common characteristic. They're dilemmas between conflicting sources of demand and value. Our instinct is generally to try and find the simplest way forward, to choose upsides, picking one over the other. Balancing two or more competing commitments often feels wrong to leaders. It's a poor compromise, a lack of decisiveness. It doesn't give us a satisfying conclusion. But the problem with binary thinking and decision-making in complex situations is that outcomes are limited at best and are often worse over time, moving the problem elsewhere. In this show, we talk to Marianne Lewis, who has made a 25-year study of both and thinking in organizational life. Great leaders, she's found, adopt a different approach. They recognize the paradoxes that underline the tensions and adopt both and thinking. Rather than choosing between the options, they embrace competing demands simultaneously. We explore the difference between tensions, dilemmas, and the paradoxes in our lives. Why it's so important to be working on paradoxes right now for leaders. The limitations of either or thinking. The four types of paradox that you can identify and how we experience them. Practical techniques to embrace both end thinking and the mindsets that sit at the heart of a both end worldview. This is an important topic for every leader. Hi, folks. Welcome back to the Evolving Leader Podcast. I'm Scott Allender. And I'm John Gomes. How are you feeling today, Mr. Gomes? I am feeling tired, but very, very optimistic. This is going to be a great show. I was with uh, Joe Biden in uh, Warsaw this week. I wasn't really. I was in Warsaw and he was there, but uh, he was about... Did he invite you? He was about 100 yards away. No, he didn't. He he shunned me. He shunned me. He had other things to do, (laughs) but... um, Typical. <laughs> How are you feeling, Scott? Uh, I'm feeling really energized and uh, excited. I know I've used those words a lot on past shows, but it is really true today. Uh, well, it's always true when I say it, but it's especially uh, poignant today. It's 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 the most prominent emotion because I am so excited for our guest. Because um, today we are joined by Marianne Lewis. Marianne and her colleague Wendy Smith have written a powerful new book called Both and Thinking, Embracing Creative Tensions to Solve Your Toughest Problems. She's dean of the University of Cincinnati's Linder School of Business and a professor of management, and her work has been widely featured in the New York Times and the Financial Times. You may have come across the very popular Harvard Business Review article, Both and Leadership, in which she and her colleagues explore the paradoxical mindset of the most successful leaders. Her research explores tensions and competing demands surrounding leadership and innovation, and she applies her paradox lens across such diverse contexts as product development, organizational change, governance, and technology implementation. She is among the world's top 1% most cited researchers in her field, and uh, today I think she's going to teach us how to breed a mule. I th- yes, you heard me correctly. <laughs> She's going to teach us that. And so uh, we're delighted that you could join us today, Marianne. Welcome to The Evolving Leader. Oh, thank you so much, Scott, John. It's it's my pleasure. Marianne, thank you. Welcome to the show. How are you feeling today? Oh, I'm feeling very good. Raring to go, and I appreciate all the work that you do on leadership. It, it, you know, and I like I love even the, the title, Evolving Leader, because I think leadership and us as leaders are always evolving. We must always be growing and stretching. And I think the work that you do helps push us. Mm. Excellent. So, Marion, we're at a dinner party and uh, the person to your side asks you what you do and how you got here. What do you say? I say that, um, uh, you know, I, I'm like well, well, Whitman. I'm a walking contradiction. Uh, they're many elements to me, but uh, in particular, I study and lead through tensions. 
Mm. And I believe that tensions are natural to the world we live in and actually pose opportunities for creativity and learning. And that's what I've done for the past 25 years is study those tensions. And increasingly, particularly as dean, I, I use them. I lead through them. Hmm. And it's nice to try to practice what you profess. Well, you start your book with uh, very personal examples that we can all relate to in terms of the tug of war between the competing commitments in our lives. Can we start perhaps with how you distinguish between tensions, dilemmas, and the paradoxes in our lives? I, I appreciate that, that question, Scott, because when we think about tensions, dilemmas, and paradoxes, they can sound like synonyms. That's mm -hmm. certainly, that's not the way Wendy and I have come to view them. Um, we think about tensions as this experience. Tension is the experience of, of tug of war, right? You really feel yourselves pulling and pulled in opposing directions. Even when I say the word, I can feel it in my chest. Mm. It, it just does something viscerally to me. Dilemma is when we start to realize we need to make a decision. And so it presents itself as a as a point in time, a moment in which this experience has to be translated into something, most often an action. Paradox is diving even deeper. Paradox is looking beyond that presenting dilemma and asking ourselves, what are these contradictions? And are we oversimplifying? And the, the symbol I think of most often when I think of paradox is the yin yang. Are these really interwoven contradictions? Are they linked in some way? And the power of paradox and understanding that linkage is it means that they're not going to go away. We might make a decision today. Maybe it's between short term and long term, right? Or between quality uh, and, and efficiency, right? I mean, we could, there's a, we could go on and on with the list. That might be a decision in the moment, but that need for today and tomorrow, self and other, et cetera, it's not going away because they're linked. We need both sides of that greater whole. And that starts to shift the way we actually work through it. I think that's a really interesting way of making a distinction because people often use those words interchangeably. Um, and it, 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 the, the response to those things is quite different. You know, the first is, is about you know, either ignoring or managing that tension, potentially. The other is about a choice. And the other is a deeper um, understanding of the solutions that you might develop as a result of that both and approach to thinking you you have in the book given some really wonderful examples about how paradox shows up in different places around the world you know not not the normal kind of business school type of examples can you take us a little bit through that research and a better understanding of perhaps why paradox is so important right now to to be working on for leaders one of the interesting findings in our research over time is that tensions are, are most acute and experienced in times with three criteria in times of change, scarcity, and plurality, right? So in terms of change, right? Times when the pace is intensified today, is, tomorrow is, today is becoming tomorrow even faster. You can see it in technology and globalization, um, the scarcity immediately spurs tensions because now we're competing over resources, priorities, a, a host of elements that might pull us in the tug of war. And then plurality, we mean multiplicity of voices, stakeholders. And in our view, we're living in the perfect storm for paradoxes. All of those three criteria are intensifying for, for leaders and really just humans at all levels. It's the world we live in. Change, scarcity, and plurality are the, the, the fodder to all of our, the work that we do, which is surfacing tensions at an enormous rate. So you distinguish between four types of paradoxes. Can you walk us through these and how we experience them? So, we, you know, as I've said, we, we've got a long list of paradoxes we can think about. And, and this started early in my work. I started to see these patterns. And I'm going to back up one step from that, Scott, because, you know, most of my, my work, particularly my early work, was always at kind of a macro level. Well, not macro. I mean, I'm not necessarily, it's all, there's so many, you know, layers to, to our onion, right? But when I say macro, I'm saying organizational leadership, C-suite kind of decisions. I think one of the great ahas for me personally, as well as professionally, is realizing the same tensions I'm talking about in the boardroom. We live in, 
individuals every day, right? A short-term, long-term, today, tomorrow attention that is huge in, in an issue for an organization. We have to make those same decisions, right? Am I, am I putting my head down, getting the work done of today and really sharpening my current strengths? Or am I looking to tomorrow? It takes very different approaches, right? But mm -hmm. so this pattern, we see these four paradoxes, these kind of categories at in an organization. I do think you could go more macro than that as well, but also in our daily lives. So let's talk about the four. So uh, paradoxes of performing. I'll start there. This is one that, we, especially in business, we'll think about a lot. It really means competing demands and specifically around definitions of success. S success to whom, right? Mm -hmm. We use the, I use the example in the book, and it's a, it's a wonderful example always to me of Paul Pullman in Unilever, who was really debating over how to turn around Unilever and asking this question, is it, you know, is it about financial responsibility or social responsibility? He said, that's the wrong question. It has to mm -hmm. be both. But that's who's the stakeholder, right? Is it a shareholder? Is it our communities and world? Is it right? And so how do you get that plurality again into it? That's paradoxes of performing. We can see them in lots of different ways in our lives because we can define success at a very human level in very different ways. And they coexist, right? Which is the paradoxical sense of this. So if I kind of think about them in or in, I, I have a little bit of an order in my mind. There's not really an order, but from those paradoxes of performing, we can move into paradoxes of organizing because how you decide you're going to work through those paradoxes can set up structures and organizations, compartmentalization or roles in our lives. But it, you know, I think it's a paradox of division of labor, right? The more complicated these paradoxes get, the more we divide and the more you divide, the more you have to connect. If not, you do this wonderful work and you're missing all the synergies and connections and coordination. So paradoxes of organizing are really about systems. And how do you do this divide and integrate on an ongoing basis? Paradoxes of, I'll do learning next. Paradoxes of learning are really about today and tomorrow. In many ways, time paradoxes. So when I said, um, the today, tomorrow, short-term, long-term, oh, I mean, those are just so pervasive in our world. So from a company perspective, I, I use the, we use the example in the book of Lego because I worked in them with them early in my career. But this question of, do we focus on our current products and our greatest strengths? And then you can look out and say, or should we be exploring for new technologies, new markets, bold innovation, right? Very, again, different kinds of skill sets, but, um, you know, what we do today determines our tomorrow and our vision of tomorrow guides our actions today. So we see that paradoxical interplay. And then the fourth are paradoxes of belonging, which can be in many ways the most emotional and personal, but it's really the challenge of deciding what groups you're in decides what groups you're out of. Deciding who's, you know, who's a we determines who's a they. And we have this constant interplay because really we, we wear so many hats in our lives. We think about inclusion. We think about diversity. I mean, and even those two terms are actually quite paradoxical, right? How are we going to recognize value differences and have a sense of belonging and collaboration? And that tug of war is a very human and social interaction kind of paradox. So that's why I think about the four, performing, organizing, learning, and belonging. Hmm. So the problem that we are looking at here in terms of paradox and the issues of, of, of tensions and dilemmas the solution is is both and thinking, but before we get to the solution and start to unpack that, let's look at the 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 alternative, which is either or thinking, uh -huh. um, and you know how how does that um, cause issues for for leaders? Because you know, it's obvious that there's a lot of either or thinking going on. Can you give us some examples of where that that sets us up to fail? Yep. John, I appreciate that. And and I, I do, even whenever I'm talking about both and thinking, I always start with the either or, in part for motivation to the both and. Um, I mean, for most, either or is our default. It's where we start. And when I say that, what I mean by either or thinking is, you know, you're facing a dilemma and 
oftentimes our first reaction is, well, let's weigh the pros and cons. Let's make let's make a decision, which is actually making a trade-off. Mm. Because for the kinds of tensions I'm talking about, there are pros and cons to both sides. So you are you're putting them on a scale and you're making a call. Um, in my view, either or thinking is limiting, but it's also potentially destructive. I mean, on the limiting side, this is a big, beautiful, complicated world. Are we really constrained to binary options? But how we framed it has already set it up that way, right? That yeah. that scale. And by the way, I should note. One of the key reasons for this is that, for this being the default, is that it feels logical and clear. It's very much how we're kind of trained in this method of analysis from a young age. Uh, It also gives us a sense of control and comfort that we can just weigh them and move on. The the more destructive part of it is really the vicious cycles it can trigger. Mm -hmm. And I see... I've seen three in particular I often think about in the research. So these are vicious cycles of of, uh, either or thinking. The first is intensification. As humans, we tend to lean toward our preferred side and we keep leaning. We -hmm. dig ruts deeper and deeper because the more we say focus on today, hitting our current targets, the better we get at hitting those targets, finishing our to-do lists, the sharper our skills. We, I mean, this is how you climb a learning curve is with some focus right? The sharper our focus and the narrower our focus over time. So all sorts of things start working together. Our routines, habits, as well as the way we're thinking, which also means what we're seeing, right? It changes your peripheral vision. All of these people efforts lead to intensification. We, we use the metaphor of the rabbit hole, right? This is how you go really far down a particular realm until you kind of realize, oh my goodness, where have I, what have, what's happened? Right. And the Lego, I use the Lego situation as an example because they were profitable for almost a hundred years, year after year. The brick is brilliant. Come on, that's it. That's phenomenal. But in getting so good at leveraging and enhancing their system of bricks, they had put their head down and missed a whole world of changes going on around them. This is in the early 2000s, right after being named Toy of the Century. They lost money for the first time which triggers the second vicious cycle, which is overcorrection, right? When we get down that rabbit hole, we realize, oh my gosh, what have we missed? And we tend to swing the pendulum, but we swing it too hard. So that Mm. we we use the, the metaphor here of the wrecking ball, right? In swinging too hard, we can actually destroy the good we've done by overestimating and basically starting to dig a new rut. In the case of Lego, they swung so hard towards radical innovation and they did it, quote unquote, brilliantly. I mean, it was called picture. It was called textbook perfect at the time. They were producing, developing new products at record pace. They'd never done anything like that. And in doing so, they really lost sight of their core values. Particularly, they one of their most important core values was this discipline, cost discipline, quality discipline, focus on their most loyal customers. That got lost in this with new product development binge. Within five years, they were on the brink of bankruptcy. Total overcorrection, right? The the third, which we see just far too often, is polarization. And we use the metaphor of trench warfare here. In this case, we're defending our rut while shooting at the other side. So rather than listening or trying to understand those perspectives, even collaborating, it's, it's a war of defenses. And in doing so, both ruts become increasingly insular, isolated, right? They're hearing each other in those echo chambers and digging their ruts deeper and in opposing directions. So we see those, I see those three particularly. I feel like that last one, um, I see that more and more in the sort of geopolitical landscape. Are you seeing that? And, and if so, what is causing in your in your research, what do you what do you estimate is causing more of that either or thinking that's happening in, happening in politics and elsewhere? Uh, Scott, I mean, it's become an increasing kind of interest of mine. Certainly, you know, I've never studied politics, mm. but as soon as we put out this book in this past year, it's 
these are the topics that have come up so often. And, you know, th there are phenomenal books on this from Ezra Klein's Why We're Polarized or Arthur mm. Brooks' um, Love Your Neighbor. I don't know if you've seen some of these. There are lots of books on this polarization and kind of coming at it from different lenses. Um, when I... When I think about it from a political, and I don't think it's just political, but it tends to be right in our face, the political mm -hmm. side, I, I tend to see kind of a pattern with this increasing trench warfare. I mean, one is this insularity, right? So we're polarized, but now we're only talking within these specific groups. The loudest and most extreme voices tend to be the loudest, making the most noise on each side. And then you have this reaction counter reaction to the extremes. So you can hear, well, the slippery slope arguments, or we certainly can't talk with them, but there, but the focus isn't on a great big middle. It's on these extremes. So you, I see this polarization to insulation to um, dehumanization, mm -hmm. right? That if you hear kind of the sides and the way they talk to each other, and I'm using the kind of this, ex, you know, extreme view, like I'm not in it, but I live those too, right? And, and, the name calling or the way people describe is is sometimes shocking to me because I'm thinking we're not actually sitting at a dinner table and having a conversation of tell me why tell me your experience in that way I mean it's remarkable what we can learn from others and mm -hmm. we realize they're not talking about an extreme they're talking about a very lived experience and it's personal right the politics isn't quite doing that is it mm. we could definitely um, spend a whole show talking about that in terms of some of these issues so earlier on, you talked about um, uh, one of the mechanisms that people default into, um, which encourages either or thinking, which is like a pros and cons list, which seems uh -huh. very logical, but creates its own inherent problem. What other kind of mental shortcuts are leaders and other people taking that encourages either or thinking? Well, I'll go back to the polarization example. I mean, I, I believe... And there's nice research around it that one of the things that's happening with this polarization, uh, insulation, kind of dehumanization is stereotyping become a v becoming a very quick shortcut to weighing the pros and cons. And if you put on that scale the extremes and or the stereotypes, you've just oversimplified and incredibly complicated topics often. Mm. I mean, sometimes we need shortcuts. Sometimes we need either or thinking, by the way. Yeah. I'm not saying that I, I don't want to be either or in myself, and it's either or or both and. I, I, <laughs> there are times that we need to make a call and move on. Where I think it's dangerous is in these complicated, nuanced issues that are much more interwoven. I use, and, and John, I believe you're in the UK, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I use a, a, the example in the book because I was dean in London, um, for four years become, before coming back to Cincinnati. And Brexit to me was a fascinating example. I mean, as an outsider, I, we, we, I watched what I, and I tried so hard and it was, you know how complicated of an issue it was, mm. but it, it, the Brexit vote happened six months after I moved in. And I tried so hard to talk with anybody who was knowledgeable to help me understand the complications of that issue. But then you go to the political realm and it was, you know, leave or remain. And that was it. And it, they made it very simple. And then it, it was such a contrast to these discussions I would be having that were very stereotyped, right? Really extreme, oversimplified. And I thought, how in the world are, we, are you having a vote on something that complicated? And I realized at some point you need to. Um, but that one just sticks out in my mind because it was just a learning experience for me. And then obviously we saw things happening in the U.S. almost right after that were very similar in their patterns. So is it a question of um, falling into the trap of seeing complex problems as simple problems? I think it's falling into the traps of oversimplifying yeah. problems. Absolutely. I think that's the way I would describe it. And then, I mean, in that trap... Right? There's the oversimplification, and we're humans, right? I mean, one of the Nobel Prize winners, um, uh, James March, talked about bounded rationality. We can only take in so much. So, naturally, we are going to simplify. We have to make sense of things. But I think you add to that the kinds of social psychology, you put on interactions that were happening, you know, you're either with us or against us. 
Mm. But you've oversimplified. I'm kind of with you, but I also see, right? But no, no, you're either with us or against us. So you're just saying you've got to get in one of the trenches in these discussions. And I think that makes it incredibly hard. And and then you have to be so brave to be in no man's land, mm. right? Between and have the conversations. But mm. we, we need to get into no man's land and say, let's... I'm, I'm afraid from a political st- standing, especially, that's a place that you don't get on a ticket. I'm talking more at the U.S. piece. Right. And that really concerns me. Because right. if the only way to get on a ticket is to be on an extreme. Mm. Then by the time you get into the office, how do you stand in no man's land and do what you have to do mm-hmm. to help us work through it? Then you're called, oh, what? Well, you know, you're, you've flip-flopped. You've, I mean, right. I, I see this all the time. I'm thinking, but these are complicated issues. You're allowed to learn. We, mm-hmm. That should be a positive. Mm-hmm. Well, I've learned quite a bit. My stance has changed. That should be rewarded. Instead, right. it's, uh, right? Think about all the language that's used when somebody does that. Completely. Instead of being proud. So let's let's talk about about then um, how we enable both and thinking. Mm-hmm. I made a comment in the intro about you were going to teach us how to breed our own mules, right? So we have a horse, we have a donkey. We need something that's uh, you know more patient than a horse. We need something smarter than a donkey, and you know create a mule out of the two, right? So right. how do we get there? How do we get there? I, I'm going to simplify it to to three steps. And, and, and the book will go into much you know, more complexity of it. But I think the first step has to be we, changing the question. Hmm. Because our questions, I mean, the way we frame our dilemma, right? We have the experience of attention, we frame a dilemma, and then we move on. But it, it's how do we shift from or to and in the question? And it's not just a word. It's the assumptions underlying hmm. that word that they have so much baggage. As soon as you say... I'm going to do the Paul Pullman Unilever. Okay, do, should, do we focus on financial uh, responsibility or social responsibility, right? You've just limited your options mm-hmm. versus how. How might we, right? And in his world, it was much more, um, how might we turn around this company financially through social and environmental responsibility, right? How might we um, find opportunities to both make a more positive impact on the world and significantly thrill our shareholders and customers, right? He started asking whole different questions to people and our questions are either limiting or opening. And I do think that's a really critical piece is changing the question. Mm -hmm. I think the second step is we call it separating and connecting. So I I always have kind of, I, I do picture the yin yang quite a bit here is, can you pull apart these opposing sides and really dive in and ask, at our best, what does each provide us, right? And in that separation, if that was all we do, what's the potential negative consequences? And this is an exercise I work with with organizations quite a bit on because as soon as you've done that exercise, you know, that looks like the exercise you might do before you make a trade-off, pros and cons. But by really separating them and challenging yourself to get at the best of both each each world and the worst of each world, you see that you need the other. Because if you lay it out, what you'll find is that the downside of one is the upside of the other and vice versa. And that sort of aha is a real shifter because you realize, okay, now I got to connect. I need to think about how am I going to hold these together, mm-hmm. right? So I'll go back to the the Unilever example because I just love the way he did it. I'm an admirer of Pullman, but is he said, "Look, I'm gonna. I'll start with the connecting. He, we have to do this. We touch two billion consumers a day at the time. So he said we must do both, and he built the sustain, Unilever sustainable living plan, and that plan was really rather simple. It's the plan said, we're going to double in 10 years, we're going to double our profits and cut in half our environmental footprint. And people literally said, you're crazy. It doesn't work that way. The bigger the company, the more harm you do. And he said, no, no, we're going to do both. And then he separated and he made separating just a, an absolute art in that mm-hmm. company. 
because every time they'd go into say launch a new product, he'd say, okay, show me the financial benefits. Show me how we're going to own that market, how we're going to grow customers, how we're going to cut costs. And then he'd say, and show me, demonstrate the social benefits. Tell me, okay, how are we going to reduce water, reduce energy, reduce pollution, tr transportation, waste, and engage the lo local community, right? And so he'd make them really line those two up, which was beautiful and challenging. And then the third piece, which is going to get to your point, Scott, about the mules, is reconsider the options. How do we start to shift what we assume is the end goal from a trade-off to something different? And we talk about mules and tightrope walking, right, as the new approach or the you know, expand your repertoire of what's possible. So the mules absolutely are the way I think most people, when you think about uh, both and thinking, you, you assume a mule because it's the best of both worlds. Right? It's some hybrid, creative integration that is um, stronger than a horse, smarter than a donkey, right? is the idea. And when they happen, they're beautiful. right? They're really creative, synergistic ahas. You know, I, I'm, I know I'm overusing, but I'm, I hope the Unilever example illustrates. But with Pullman, one of their mules that was brilliant is they were taking, uh, I think it was surf detergent into Western Africa. And they were the first firm to come up with sachets, those little packets, right? But the, the reason that was a mule is that, oh, you know, they were fantastic for, from an environmental social responsibility, right, at the time. Now, I think they've learned from this, which I'll get to, but uh, far less waste, easier to transport, so less uh, pollution, re much easier for the local retailers in these communities to sell. And they cost less, right? Significantly reduced costs. And customers loved them, right? So they found something. But here's the limit to the mule. The limit to the mule is, and it really is beautiful even in the, the metaphor, is mules are sterile. Hmm. So they're temporary. They're one-offs. Even in the case of sachets, I was actually seeing this the other day, Unilever's realized they're not sustainable enough. They're filling landfills. So we got to keep experimenting. That's okay, right? I mean, it's okay to keep experimenting. It was still better than what they were going to do. And now they're just going to keep getting better. But it's a one-off. More often, what we see, and I certainly see this, and I try to live this, is we call tightrope walking. If you think about a tightrope walker, and I don't do a lot of official tightrope walking, <laughs> um, they keep moving forward with their eyes on a goal on the horizon. And in moving forward, they take these micro shifts left and right, right? Just back and forth, back and forth. So in the case of Unilever, you know, if, if when times are tight, we're going to, we're going to maybe lean in a little bit more into the financial. We got to, we got to make sure the costs are right and we're hitting our targets. And when, when resources are flush, we're going to dump, we're going to put more money. We're going to reinvest into the social innovations that we're doing. We're going to get more creative on that, but the sustainable living plan serves as a guardrail because if you lean too far on either side, you're falling off mm -hmm. and you got to keep those vicious cycles in mind, right? So you're, you're, how do you keep moving? Because it's the moving that's important in that regard. Mm -hmm. And I think we do this all the time, but I'm not saying tightrope walking is easy either. Cause I mean, talking to Paul about this, he would say, you know, communication's hard because people back to the politics will say, are you flip-flopping? Are you sending mixed messages? And he would, I mean, he was a broken record and he will admit it in the, in the best possible way. He would start the meetings reminding them, remember the goal? Double the profits, cut, cut in half the environmental footprint. And then he'd say, and guess what? It's quarterly earnings time. We've got some hard work to do. We're going to focus in a bit on the, on the finance side, right? And so that's the way he was moving. He, he, wouldn't see, he would say, yeah, we're going to focus more today on X than Y, but we got a big picture. Remember where we're going and work that way. We, I see this with really good uh, leaders when they're doing this. That communication's an art mm -hmm. and keeping people in mind of what's, what's at the end goal and how you're making those micro shifts. So they understand it is both. And it's some more like juggling sometimes, right? They're not, you're not necessarily holding them both at the exact same time. Hi, this is Emma Sinclair business psychologist, occasional co-host, and fan of the Evolving Leader podcast. 
We absolutely love putting this podcast together and we can see that our audience grows with each new episode, suggesting that you like it too. It would be a huge help if you could take a few minutes to complete our short anonymous listener survey, telling us what you value most about the podcast. The link to the survey is in the show notes. Thanks so much. A major part of your work is looking at the assumptions that we should consider if we want to build this paradox mindset. And you raise the point that that's not easy. And, and like this type walk, walking um, metaphor, it, it can make you feel quite queasy at times, for tigginess. Can you talk to us about why that is and how you've helped executives to peer over the edge of their existing ways and find a different way forward? I fervently believe you can develop a paradox mindset and you can get really good at paradox thinking. And I do think it's hard. Mm. I mean, I think it, the, one of the pieces that we, we've studied increasingly and they're amazing. Um, we've got an amazing community of paradox scholars globally that do a lot of work in it is around the emotions side of it. It is uncomfortable to be living in the tension, to work through the tension and getting comfort, finding comfort in the discomfort um, takes some time. Part of it is you've got to come to the realization that I'm in here, I'm having the difficult debate, discussion, whatever it is, because I know it will make a, for a better mule or tightrope walking at the end, right? I, I know I need to have that. Um, but it takes some psychological safety, right? The ability, the, some trust that we're all here wanting that same end goal. And this isn't personal, but we're going to really put this on the table, right? If you don't, if, if I don't feel the tension in the room, Bring it. Where is it? We're missing sides. Unless it's a really simple decision, if, if you bring a solution too fast, you, you're, you've clearly missed some perspectives in this and probably some tools. But I think some, a big part of it is you've got to actually call out the tension. This, this is uncomfortable. Let's keep working through. The fact that it's uncomfortable actually means that there's something probably there. You know, I think about tensions as creative friction. Other people have talked about that, you know, and seeing that as a value is really important. If not, it triggers this defense that goes the other direction, right? I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to put up my more active defenses and either fight or defend my rut or whatever the case might be. Um, but I think, John, the more I've seen, it's I'm amazed at, the, at great both end leaders at their ability to be vulnerable to be in that space and call out, right? Build, build really challenging boards and teams because they want the differences around the table. And is that difference helping you to get it? Because it's, it's the thing about assumptions that is always challenging is that you don't know their assumptions a lot of the time. You no. see them as yeah. truth or you see them as inevitable or you see them as immovable or whatever it is. That, but, and sometimes you don't even see them at all because they're just invisible to you because that's how you construct reality. How do you, is this um, process of pointing out the, the up and downside of, of, the, of the opposing things, is that where the, the assumptions get flushed out? How do you surface them actively? I think the, your, to your point, the separating and connecting exercise is extremely helpful in really digging into the opposing sides. But, you know, I, I don't know. There was something you said, John, that, that was powerful to me as well, because even in, I think, Scott, you were reading my, my bio, and I've always thought about myself as studying uh, tensions of leadership and innovation. But after a quarter of a decade, I mean, quarter of a century, I think it's all about learning. I really think it's about learning mm. and always pushing ourselves. So in that separating and connecting, I mean, it's, I've helped organizations do it in different ways. But one example that I found really helpful is to push, say, you, you can feel kind of divides in a room, right? If, if you bring in a group and you go, okay, that's the, right, that's the old guard or the new guard or whatever, whatever it is you're debating is actually asking them to take the opposing view. I, I want you to make a really strong case for what I, I want to hear. How much have you listened, right, to what they've done, to what they're saying, and vice versa? I mean, there are different ways to kind of dig down into this. And by the way, I should say it's simplest to think about two sides, but oftentimes there are many more than that, right? And in doing that exercise, you might find, oh, 
there's there's another side right over there and you start to bring it into the room but fleshing them out really digging into it is how you understand there's value in those sides um and Sounds I like marriage counseling. Point. You don't know what you don't know until you get into those rooms. <laughs> We're not back on you again, Scott. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that you're, what you're saying here because calling out the tensions and the discomfort because any conversation around mindset that doesn't include emotions really raises red flags for John and I. And so I love this. And how knowing that people by, you know, it's our nature to want to move away from negatively experienced emotions. You gave a great example of how you get them to adopt maybe a, a, the opposite vantage point. What other tactics or approaches do you take with leaders to get them to not move away from the uncomfortable emotion, to use emotions, positive and negatively experienced emotions, to arrive at this, you know, either tightrope or mule kind of mm -hmm. approach? So, so one type of approach I would, I would encourage is I think about improvisation. Improvisation is such a cool paradoxical term because it really means creativity with constraints, mm. like that the constraints actually spark creativity. And the reason I'm using it here is saying to, to build an opportunity for improvisation, you got to get clear about what the frame is. What's the box that you're going to get creative inside. So a tactic, a tool that you can do is to get really sharp about not only what is the end goal, but what else is surrounding that box? Is it values, right? Is it sub-objectives? Let's get sharp on what we all agree around this table. We're going to work within, right? These are the guardrails. Because within that guardrail, we're going to let all, we're going to have whatever discussions, debates, challenges we have, but knowing what those guardrails are, they actually provide some security because we've already come to an agreement of what the box looks like. Mm -hmm. Now we can really focus in on how do we make the most of the challenges within. You know, there was a study quite some time ago that I think comes up again and again in those, and I'm sure you've both seen it in various ways. And it was by a, a fellow by name of uh, Ozigwe, but he talked about conflict that is both I mean, it's a double-edged sword too, right? Conflict can be totally destructive and it can be incredibly generative, right? At the same time. And the way he kind of pulls these apart is he said that there are two types of conflict. And within this box, we can get much clearer about the right kind of conflict. The kind of conflict that is dangerous and destructive is aff affective conflict. It's personal. It's emotional. This is when, this is the difference between saying, that's a, you're, you're ridiculous. I can't believe you'd say that versus, boy, I don't see that option working very mm, well. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, there's a, it just sounds very personal. The uh, other kind of conflict is that we call it task conflict. But the, the point there is within the box, keep focusing. Okay. But I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not sure how it gets us to X, right? We've all said we're getting to X. I'm not seeing that connection. So then, right? This is an, I'm, I'm not saying you're stupid. I'm saying, let's, I don't know that we're on task here, right? Can we stay focused there? Um, so this is one way I would encourage, right? Because that improvisation lets us get all sorts of creativity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw this with Lego, one of the coolest examples I've seen in a long time um, with, uh, I mean, it, it was a while ago, but this is when they were trying to figure out, all right, when we were on one when we're going down the rabbit hole, uh, I give you the example. It took them, I think this is right. It took them seven years to add the color green and it was their fifth color, right? That's how disciplined they were, right? It took one person to say no, right? And it was done. So that's how long it was taking. Um, and on the flip side, during the, the binge period, the product development binge period, it was like everything goes and it was kind of, and so they thought, all right, our costs are completely out of control. And they realized one of the reasons the costs have gotten completely out of control is specialty bricks. I actually have bricks somewhere around here. But uh, picture the, let's picture the standard brick, you know, the six, mm -hmm. right, squares. Those cost almost nothing, right? They say you can circle the globe every year like seven times with the number of standard Lego bricks. They're just produced 24-7, right? So, my, you know, but a specialty brick is 
maybe it could be as much as a hundred times more expensive because it, de- it all depends on how many you actually make. And it may, mm-hmm. maybe you're not only making it for one box. And the cost had gotten completely out of control in that binge because they went crazy on the specialty bricks. So Lego asked themselves, all right, how many specialty bricks should we have in a box? Which sounds like a weird question, but they said, this is breaking the bank. So they did kind of two cool studies within the improvisation. They said, all right, let's do a psychology study first. Let's get, let's figure out with psychologists, how many do you need specialty bricks to get the wow? Right? Ooh, wow. How many do you need? It wasn't many. All right? It's probably not going to surprise you. It's not many bricks to get the wow. And then the, the accountants came in to do the other side of the equation, and they said, how many can we afford? All right? So the improvisation on this piece is they said, okay, and I, I, I'm, I'm being, you know, general, but they said, basically, we, you can have 10% of every box specialty bricks. It's plenty to get the wow. And we will have significant margins on every box, right? But what it did to the creativity is it unleashed it because suddenly you had designers going, oh, I've only got 10%. How do I use them? Right. Well, maybe, are you doing a different thing? Maybe we could share one, you see? Mm-hmm. And so it sparked all this cool change in creativity within a box that made sure they were incredibly financially successful in it. Creative, right? I think this is one of the reasons that Legos come out of it. One of the most innovative and disciplined companies in the world is they've gotten really good at the tightrope walking. Mm. You know? Now I want to run out and get a box of Legos when this Don't conversation's over. And then yeah. Yeah, try not to step on them. <laughs> I, um, I want to pull that out for a moment that, because that just it was a little bit of an aha moment for me there in terms of, you know, obviously there's a long history of thinking about theory of constraint around creative thinking. And you know this these two kind of opposing questions um how many do you do you need versus how many can you afford? I think that's a brilliant question that you could apply in so many different realms, so just underline that for a second um Marianne, organizations are designed primarily to um align resources with their goals and minimize risk, let's be honest. Can you talk about how your research and ideas can help leaders think about structures to stabilize the organization in the face of uncertainty? I mean, that's that's a really important question, John. I, in some ways, to me, I, I'll take that back to the uh, discussion of the four different types of paradoxes. Because just as these paradoxes are all connected, so too are our responses. Right? So if we start and say, let's get clear about what we think success looks like in all its paradoxical nature, right? The social and the financial, right? Our people and our customers. I mean, you, you can pick lots of tensions into that box. Then we can start saying, okay, let's look at the organiz- organizing paradoxes. So what are the structures and systems we need that right, actually match those tensions? How are we thinking about separating and connecting in our structures. Yeah. And there, I mean, there's not one, this is not a cookie cutter. There are so many ways to do it. But the key is, are we aligning those structures and systems and their paradoxical nature to the goals? You know, I mean, if we think about, I mean, there, there, I, I study a lot around the innovation field and, and there are so many different ways I've seen organizations kind of pull apart. Okay, where are we going to put the radical innovation folks? right? The people in the blue sky, because that's a very different group than the, you know, make the, make the pen better, make the widget better, right? Group, right? They just, everything about it. So in some ways we're going to really separate those. And we got to think about how we're going to make sure that they're connecting and we're learning between those because those blue skies are going to become these, right? We're going to start to see this link between the old and the new. Um, But I think in terms of part of your question to me, John, and the reason I went there is I think about that as ambidexterity, right? How do we get into agility? And I believe one of the key ways that we get to be more agile, ambidextrous learning organizations and leaders is by building this matching between our efforts and understanding that in that matching, they're they're going to continue changing. I mean, you, we talked about mindsets, but our organizations get so rigid over time. 
right? That's what institutionalizing means. And it's very hard to change. We know that. So can we start to build those connections in ways that also push us to ask, is it still working? Right? Are our goal? So it starts with the big world. Now, are our goals and definitions of success still holding? I can't remember which one of you asked it, but this is back to we don't know what we don't know. So if we are asking that question with intentionality on a regular basis, right, from the goals to our structures to, right, our learning to the belonging, which is getting into the people. Um, and see, I have to be careful because even as I'm talking about that, it can come unwieldy very quickly. Mm -hmm. The simplest way to do it is just focus on the goals and the structures. I think the other pieces come in a little bit more naturally. I mean, belonging gets into a lot of the culture pieces, right? Um, but I think if th the first step is, can you think almost in a modular sort of way about how we're connecting the different sides of the coins, both on the goals and on the structure? I hear that your current research is into um, how individuals manage a building a paradox mindset. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now? Thank you, John. You know that it's been fast. It's been such an interesting next chapter for me because I've always been studying more at the organizational and team level, and working with some phenomenal researchers, international researchers. We basically said, "Well, we we got to figure out how to measure a paradox mindset individually." So we we've done a measure that was in one of the top journals. So it's also started to get really used. Um, we've now studied thousands of people in, across continents and languages. And so let me start with the measure. The measure basically says a paradox mindset is two dimensions. The first dimension is how much does someone experience tensions? Some of us are super sensitized. I see them in my sleep, right? But other people, either because they're, you know, I don't know, they're yoga instructors, just live in a different kind of life, <laughs> or they just don't want to see them, right? So we really can see significant differences in how much people experience them. And then the other is how do people respond, right? Are you more of an either or thinker, which is, I see them as problems. I see them as things that make me really uncomfortable. I, right? So we've got a whole right, in this survey instrument. And on the flip side, do you see them as opportunities, right? Do you see them as sources of creative friction? And, and what we found in this work, and it's really quite robust now, we thought there'd be more cultural differences. So far, we're not seeing them. We've done this in, across many different languages um, and, and locales, is that the, the, strong, the more one experiences tensions, the more powerful the positive impact of both end thinking. OK, so well, in, I'll be more specific. So in a heightened tension experience, I'm going to say that's, I live it. Maybe you guys do. Right. That if you are a paradox, if you think in terms of paradox, you have a paradox mindset, according to the person's supervisor. Right. So we actually were doing their supervisor's feedback as well as the individuals. That individual is higher performing and more creative, higher performing mm. and more creative than an either or thinker. And if we ask the individual, because we're doing both, they're also more satisfied. That is a really powerful triumvirate. Mm. Higher performing, more creative, more satisfied in oh, a high, highly tenuous existence. So to us, especially as we started was saying, you know, this is world with a plurality, scarcity, and change is kind of the perfect storm. We need mo more both and thinkers. So now we're using this, and a lot of the colleagues that we work with uh, internationally are using it to start, start to say, okay, so how do, we, how do we actually develop this? And let's start tracking this over time. Because you're not, I don't believe by any stretch that you're born one way or the other. I do think more of us are trained early to think of either or. So we might have to have more interventions to figure out how do we, you know, how do you expand the toolkit to both and. But that's some of the work that we're doing now. And, and it's, it's not only a lot of fun, but it's really interesting to see how it layers up from the individual to the leader or organizational level. And is that, is that um, are the findings, the interim findings available anywhere or is it still work in progress? No, they are, they are available. They've been published in a few different places. Um, the, the starting measurement is in uh, Academy of Management Journal in 2018. Okay, excellent. Because that's such important work. I'm curious if you found 
a difference in motivations behind various people's experience with either or thinking. So uh, this is getting on a more personality based level. But I'm as you were talking, I'm thinking, you know, I, I talk to people who tend to think that something's either right or it's wrong or it's good or it's bad. And I talk to other people who tend to orient around either I'm safe in this scenario or I'm not, or I'm secure or I'm not. And then I talk to other people who have this perspective that either I'm liked and appreciated or I'm not. On a personal level, do you did, did any of your research unveil differences in how people experience either or thinking? Uh, Scott, not necessarily mine individually, but what I'm seeing now, it, just in the community of scholars in this, is exactly what you're saying. Because now the questions are, how does this link to introversion, extroversion, risk mm. aversion, right? Emotional intelligence. I mean, all of those pieces, all of those are new studies, right? Mm. So what's exciting and the reason we decided we had to start by developing a measure is to unlock the kind of research you're talking about, which is whatever you're studying, put a paradox mindset into it and let's start seeing the relationships. We call that a nominal logical net, right? How do we build the whole constellation because there's so much work to, to your point on personality, mindsets. I mean, let's put growth mindset, fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that we could be studying now, but we didn't even have, we didn't have a tool we could do that. So that's why to us this was important. So I don't have a particular example there, but it's it's exciting to me. You said I was, you know, top 1% cited. The reason is that it's, it, people are like using these things, which mm -hmm. is very fulfilling to me because I wouldn't be doing this research if I didn't think it mattered. So I'm glad to see it kind of expanding in that way. Well, we're grateful for your research and really grateful for your time. I, I This is the conversation I needed to have this morning. So thank you. Yeah, thank me you too. So much. Yeah, absolutely, Mary. And I, it's, um, yeah, a couple of things there have really got my brain buzzing for the weekend. So I'm very appreciative mm. of that. Thank you. And yeah. I have to say that um, the book is, um, is incredible. We, we, Scott said at the beginning, it's very powerful because um, it's not just this. This topic is inherently complicated <laughs> for a lot of a lot of folk. Um, and what you've done is you've broken it down into a series of very very logical steps um, that are all actionable. They all kind of help you to increase uh, building this paradox mindset. And I could feel in in my uh, reading of it how I was. It, what, what I could understand already I was good at doing naturally or through experience and where there are areas for opportunities. So that, that it, it, it meant it was a, it was a very good tool, um, mm -hmm. not just for understanding intellectually, but actually practically doing something. So I really um, wanted to flag that. Well, I appreciate it very much. And again, I appreciate both of you and the work that you do on this podcast. So thank you for having yeah. me. Thank you. And folks, order your copy of Both and Thinking today. And until next time, remember, the world is evolving. Are you? <laughs>